So uh, welcome everyone to the first of the general relativity uh, sessions, also on behalf of my uh, co-organizer, uh, Gerhard Huisken, who's participating uh, online. And our first speaker today is uh, Greg Fonodavlos from the Sorbonne University in Paris. Um, Greg finished his PhD with uh, Spiros Alexakis in Toronto in 2016 and was then a postdoc in uh, the University of Cambridge and in, in Paris. And today he will speak to us about a stable Big Bang formation in general relativity. The Thank stage you is much. yours. Thanks, Gustav. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. So I will be talking about uh, some joint work with Igor Rodniansky and Jared Speck. Let's see if this works. Up, oh, it does. Okay. All right. So let's start. Let's start with the brief introduction, since everyone is familiar with uh, GR. So bold face G uh, will be a Lorentzian metric for us, defined over. A time interval uh, times a compact space of dimension d larger or equal to 3. And we'll be focusing on the vacuum or uh, massless color field case uh, for which the Einstein equations uh, take this form. Um, so here, uh, the space time Ricci tensor is given as a product of two derivatives of the scalar field, and the scalar field satisfies pure wave equation. So in the absence of a scalar field, when c is equal to zero, we retrieve the uh, Einstein vacuum equations. So as we all very well know, uh, this system has an evolutionary part, which is of wave type. The initial data are given along space like Cauchy hypersurface sigma one, and they consist of the first and second fundamental form, G and K, the uh, initial value of the scalar field and its time derivative. And they have to satisfy uh, a set of constraint equations, which in this setting take, take the, the following form. Okay, and uh, thanks to the pioneering work of uh, Shoke Brucha and Shoke Brucha and Gerok, we know that this system has a well posed initial value problem. And moreover, uh, there exists a unique maximum solution to each sufficiently regular initial data set. Okay. So now uh, let's move on to the protagonists of this talk, the so-called generalized Casa solutions. So these are defined along the half line times the d-dimensional torus. They take this, uh, this form where um, the exponents pi and uh, b are constants. They have to satisfy, these constants have to satisfy the Kastner relations, so the sum of the pi's is equal to one, the sum of the squares is equal to one minus b squared, and in the case where b is equal to zero, so in vacuum, uh, we also impose that pi is less than one to exclude the flat solution, which is not that interesting. So a characteristic feature of these solutions is that there is an initial singularity, which we call the Big Bang, in particular the area of the time slices, sigma t, is shrinking to zero as t goes to zero, and uh, cur curvature invariants blow up. This is a space-like singularity because it's uh, synchronized by a regular time function, so at t equals zero. Okay, and of course, we would like to understand uh, the general dynamical solutions, so let me give you a um, brief overview of the conjectural picture, so what is expected to happen. So first of all, we have the celebrated uh, Hawking incompleteness theorem that tells us that uh, if the past mean curvature is strictly negative along sigma one, which is, we can take to be t equals one here, uh, the space-time solution will be uh, incomplete in the past direction. So in finite time, we will hit a boundary. And this particular is a condition that is satisfied for perturbations of the generalized uh, Kastner solutions. Okay, and uh, now the main question is whether this breakdown, this incompleteness is associated to the formation of the singularity. And uh, well, the expectation is that generically, yes, this is also the theme of strong causative censorship conjecture. 
And I said generically because there are pathological examples which are everywhere smooth and they can be continued past the, uh, the boundary uh, in infinitely many ways um, and not uniquely determined by the uh, initial data. So that leads to a failure of determinism. But the hope is that these, these examples are unstable and we will not see them in reality. Um, another question is that, okay, if, if there is a singularity, what, what's the character of the singularity? Is it space-like or not? And, and what's the behavior of the solution towards the singularity? So it turns out that in, in the cosmological setting and the present uh, setting, the singularities uh, are expected to be of Kastner type. I will explain what I mean by that. In the so-called subcritical regime, in particular Kastner, the explicit Kastner solution should be stable near the Big Bang singularities uh, in this regime, and that's the, the work that I would like to um, tell you about today. Uh, this should be contrasted with the situation um, in black hole interior where there is a, a similar type of breakdown. And uh, there, uh, thanks to um, recent breakthrough work by the Fermus Luke, there is, uh, we know that uh, generically there should be a null Cauchy horizon near time like infinity. So you see there's like, uh, multiple scenarios that can happen as far as singularity formation is concerned in, in GR. And moreover, even if it's space-like, as it is, for example, in the cosmological setting, the, the, the solutions that are uh, described, uh, there could be um, something more um, messy, uh, the so-called oscillatory or BKL scenario, uh, conjectured by um, three Russian physicists, Belinsky, Kalatnikov, and Lifshitz. Um, okay, and, well, I'm not going to uh, explain more about that. Uh, but let's move on to the, um, the solutions, the, the, singular, uh, uh, the singularities that we uh, by now understand quite well, the so-called Kastner type singularities. So you should think of these as um, singular solutions. There is a Big Bang singularity at equals zero, and the asymptotic profile of the solution is given uh, by this form. So it is like a a Kastner singularity, but the Kastner exponents and the coefficient of the logarithm, so the leading order term, uh, these are functions, the vari, uh, relative to the spatial coordinates. And moreover, the principal uh, one forms, omega i, they're not coordinate one forms, but they're a linear combination of the coordinate one forms, and the coefficients are also functions of, of space. Okay, and again, the Kastner relations are satisfied, but now point-wise. Okay. All right, so now let's present some heuristics. Uh, let's see how logical it is to expect the singularities to be of Kastner type in a general situation. Okay, so first we consider an orthonormal frame, which is adapted to the eigenvectors of the psychofundamental form. Using the ansatz, the type of the... Uh, Kastner type singularity, we compute that these components, Kij, are like 1 over t. And for example, in particular, thanks to the sum of the pi is equal to 1, the mean curvature is exactly minus 1 over t. Okay, and now we want to plug this in to the Einstein equations and see whether it's consistent. So, for example, uh, Kij satisfies an evolution equation uh, of the following type, where, in uh, for example, if um, if uh, bold face G is the solution to the Einstein vacuum equations, the last term is zero. So these are the so-called so second variation equations. Um, and now it's clear that uh, one will con can confirm the, the leading order ansatz if the right-hand side is less singular than t to the minus two, because we just integrate, we use integrating factors, and we, we see that the leading order behavior of K is determined by the, the general solution of the, the ODE, the left-hand side, and the inhomogeneous term in the right-hand side does, uh, is lower order, okay? Um, never, however, uh, by using the ansatz once more, uh, we see that this partial Ricci curvature, which is the Ricci curvature of the induced metric along the, the time slices, contains powers of T uh, with exponents of this form, where you have uh, this algebraic sum of all possible Kastner exponents with uh, distinct indices. 
Okay. So now it's immediate that in order to have uh, that this crucial estimate, which is, leads to the consistency of the initial Kastner type ansatz, the fact that the spatial energy curvature is less singular than t to the minus two, we need that all these possible combinations, algebraic sums of the PIs um, um, with the distinct indices has to be less than one. And this is what it's called subcriticality condition. Okay, so um, the subcritical regime contain, includes, for example, the scala field model for all spatial dimensions larger or equal to three, in particular when the scala field is large enough such that the cast and exponents are all positive. So for example, you can take them all to be equal to one third and this would give you like certain coefficient for the logarithm of the scala field. Okay, and then you see that just by using the fact that the sum of the PIs is uh, equal to one, that all these algebraic sums uh, in dimension three, three plus one, uh, are less than one, okay? Because the PB is uh, positive there. Okay. Um, also, uh, in vacuum, for dimensions, uh, spatial dimensions larger or equal to 10, the subcriticality condition is non-empty and, and open. Uh, however, for the important case of one plus three vacuum, the, the subcriticality condition is violated for all uh, possible uh, combinations of Kastner exponents. And that's easy to see because the fact that the sum of the PIs and the sum of the squares of the PIs is equal to one means that at least one Kastner exponent is negative. So let's say P1. Then if you consider this particular combination, um, okay, here, uh, you, you have that uh, using again the fact that the sum of the PIs is, uh, is one, you, you get something, an expression, which is larger than one. So this sort of invalidates the whole, the whole uh, ansatz. And the key observation that goes back to BKL is that the crucial estimate that the spatial energy coverage is less singular to the minus two is valid if this type of polarization condition is, uh, is satisfied, where omega one here is the principal direction corresponding to the negative Kastner exponent. But this uh, eliminates one of the degrees of freedom, so it constrains this coefficients of omega one, the Cij's, which means, so they concluded that Kastner type singularity should not be generic in one plus three vacuum. Okay, so in particular, there should be instabilities, and then they went on to, to speculate about these oscillations, which, okay, I'm not going to talk about, but loosely speaking, there should be a, a, a flip of the Kastner exponents, the negative Kastner exponent becoming positive and vice versa, infinitely many times as you approach the singularity. Um, and, uh, okay, between this type of uh, bounces, the solution should be described by some Kastner different one at, the, uh, at each time, uh, Kastner type solution. So even in that setting, Kastner understanding Kastner type singularity is in, it's an important first step. Okay, so now let's mention uh, rigorous results. Okay, um, everything that we said so far is pretty much heuristic. So these are divided in the following, roughly the following categories. So there's been quite a lot of work. Um, so first of all, in Gaudi symmetry, which is a sort of toroidal symmetry, uh, there's a complete understanding of all solutions for all initial data. Um, and uh, the, the bottom line is that the singularity is of Kastner type, more or less. So there is this nasty thing of so-called spikes, but these are found where there is a fluctuation in the, sort of in the, in the behavior of the solution. Uh, but these are finitely many spatial points, and everywhere else, everything's uh, Kastner type. Then there are constructions of Kastner type singularities. So this is, which, this is sort of like um, solving a in singular initial value problem. So we go at equals zero, we prescribe the linear order behavior we want to see, and then we want to solve for a remainder. But this already sort of forces the, the solution to behave in a certain way, and it's not, let's, let's say, the, dynamic, the understanding of the dynamical problem, which is the ideal goal. Nevertheless, it's been important work that, uh, by, by many people. 
uh, which led us to uh, better understand the, the Kasten type singularities. Then there's the stability of the explicit Kasten solutions near their singularities. And uh, by stability, I mean perturbing the, the Kastner initial data away from the singularity and, and controlling the solution, understanding how the singularity forms in the past. Okay, uh, then there are conditional results of the type, if a certain important quantity like the spatial scalar curvature behaves in a certain way, then the singularity is of this form, or sort of, okay. And then the least understood category is the BKL oscillatory scenario. And uh, the first work is by Ringstrom, 2001. And there, was some, there are some sequent works, but every, all of them are confined in the homogeneous setting. So you have the PDE becomes an ODE in time. And okay, even then, even in that regime, um, the special situation, not everything is understood, but nevertheless, it's uh, unclear how faithful this, uh, what, what kind of conclusion one can draw from the hom just hom study of homogeneous solutions. Okay, so that's the regime that we would like to understand more, I guess. Okay, so now for the rest of the talk, let's um, focus on the stability problem, which I would like to present to you. Um, so let's, let's repeat what is the goal. Um, so we consider a fixed Kastner solution, okay, who, that satisfies the supercriticality condition, okay? Um, then we perturb the cast initial data at t equals one, and we try to control the solution in the past direction. Okay, uh, so in particular, we would like to prove that the uh, singularity forms and that it is of cast and type in the sense that we described earlier in the, in, in the heuristics. And okay, stability here should be realized in a renormalized sense. So things will blow up, but certain renormalized quantities will have a limit, and this limit, for example, the cast exponents, their values should be close to the background fixed cast values, okay? And what are the main difficulties? So in contrast to the, the heuristics where one already assumed there's a singularity and it's synchronized by some time function, here we don't really know what is the preferred time function that will synchronize the singularity, so locating the singularity is an important aspect of the problem. Then, due to the singular behavior of the solution, one cannot have like sharp estimates, but they will be degenerate. And there's other issues like uh, loss of derivatives. So there's, um, you could say, quite a few uh, technical difficulties that were not present in the in the in the sort of the heuristic. Uh, uh, understand analysis of the of the problem. Uh, okay, and before uh, presenting the main ideas of the proof, let's introduce a little bit of framework. So again, we have a splitting of the space-time metric relative to the time function, but here we we allow for um, for non-trivial laps. So this is not proper time. Uh, we consider an orthonormal frame that is adapted to the, the, the constant time foliation, meaning that EI is, um, is tangent to sigma t and E0 is, is normal to sigma t. And, okay, it's propagated such, such that it remains uh, uh, adapted, but it's, it's initialized at equals one. So a priori, there's no reason why this frame should be adapted to the eigenvectors of the second fundamental form. In, in fact, this is not true. And okay, we have to live with this. Um, okay, and the main unknowns will be the uh, connection coefficients associated with this orthonormal frame, namely the components of the second fundamental form, Kij, evaluated against this uh, orthonormal frame, and the, uh, the spatial connection coefficients. Okay. So already, okay, so that sort of, sorry, that sort of fixes the gauge uh, apart from the choice of the time function. So we still have some freedom in choosing T. And uh, already the main, uh, very uh, crucial um, consideration here um, 
comes into play. Namely, we, uh, we choose t such that the, the mean curvature of the constant time slices is minus one over t, in particular uh, independent of the spatial variables. So this is what's called uh, constant mean curvature foliation. And this leads to a elliptic equation for the labs. So the, this last equation here, in the end, uh, here I'm using Einstein's summation for repeated, repeated indices. So this is sort of the Laplacian. OK, and morally, this is a gauge of infinite speed of propagation. And one could hope that it will synchronize the singularity at equal zero. Of course, everything has to be proved in, in the overall scheme. But that's, uh, if that is true, it's an important analytical uh, simplification. OK, and that fixes the gauge. And now we have uh, the Einstein equations in this framework. And they take the following form. So we have uh, the second variation equations that we saw before in the heuristic analysis for this, the components of the second fundamental form. In the right-hand side here, we have uh, first derivatives of the spatial connection coefficients. So this comes from the spatial Ricci curvature that we saw before. You, we now also have the Haitian of the laps because the laps is not one. OK, uh, then we have the first variation equation, which is just an ODE in the frame coefficients. And uh, we find it convenient to also have an ODE, uh, uh, no, a PDE, uh, uh, an evolution equation for the, uh, connection, the spatial connection coefficients. OK, and then you also have the wave equation for the scalar field when it exists, if we are uh, if we're studying the Einstein uh, scalar field system. OK, so for the last two equations, the wave equation and the elliptic equation, the, the, how to do the estimates is sort of, you could say, straightforward. Or OK, apart from the singularity, of course. But um, the, the most important aspect in the problem is to, to estimate or to understand how to estimate the geometric variables, in particular the, the uh, k and, uh, and gamma. So these connection coefficients satisfy a first order PDE since there are spatial derivatives in the right-hand side. OK. And uh, so this is what we'll be uh, focusing on. Um, so what is the overall plan? So first of all, uh, the k and gamma do not satisfy really a, a symmetric hyperbolic system. So if you try to do, uh, if you try to write down energy identity, here I'm using again Einstein summation for repeated indices, you will see that there is always a term uh, which is not, in the right-hand side, a first-order term, which is not the whole derivative of something. So when you integrate in space, this will not cancel out. Uh, but the key observation, so this could lead to a loss of, of derivatives, but the key observation is that to, to top order, this is the divergence of k, uh, or the, this ei, kij, which uh, by virtue of the momentum constraint and the gauge condition, the CMC condition, this can be replaced by uh, terms which are more regular. So at the end of the day, one can get an energy identity and, and, and derive a priori estimates, OK? Um, now, a second remark is that if one wants to treat all kind of ranges of anisotropic Kastner exponents within, of course, the subcritical regime, um, uh, one will get borderline terms, a large amount of borderline terms, which are of this, this form. So uh, there will be terms which are like k times gamma in the energy estimates, and we will need to replace k by its point C0 behavior, which is like 1 over t, as we saw. OK, so this will create terms which have coefficients that are not uniformly integrable in 0, 1. OK, just that's what we mean, borderline non-integrable. Um, and ultimately, once we try to control a, a top order energy, let's say, that contains n derivative of the variables, we will not be able to, to prove a sharp estimate, but the, the best one can do is to say that it doesn't blow up faster than uh, a big negative power of t. Okay, so one, again, due to the anisotropy of the, the background coefficients, one cannot hope for c star to be uh, small. So this kind of estimate is very degenerate and sort of useless. Uh, it doesn't give you the desired control over the, uh, the unknowns. OK, so one has to live with this. And the, the idea is to, to do a bootstrap argument 
uh, that is consistent with this highly degenerate top order estimates, but that one can recover near optimal control at the low orders or at least at C0, which is actually needed in order even to, to derive this degenerate estimate. We assumed here, for example, that K is like one over T in C0. So, so these this, this two have to be, I mean, uh, optimal C0 control is, is needed uh, to, um, to close the whole, the whole scheme. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go to the uh, crucial C0 control. So how is this um, uh, done? So once we have obtained energy estimates, uh, we can look at the, uh, the uh, equations, the first order equations as ODEs by treating the right hand sides as inhomogeneous terms. Okay, so somewhere here. Um, the, and what we need is that uh, the variables are less singular than one over t, the spatial variables, and, and k is like one over t. I mean, this is the optimal behavior. So the, the essential thing is to, to get this integrability in time of the spatial variables, because then if one goes to the right-hand side of the equations, one sees that uh, the right-hand side is less singular than t to the minus two, which was the essential thing in the heuristic analysis. Of course, in this, in this um, uh, uh, setting, I mean, it's, it's essential that every term is, is, doesn't have more than two factors. So this, the, the way we analyze the nonlinear terms here plays a role. Uh, for example, if gamma is integrable, then gamma times gamma will be less singular than t to the minus two. And then uh, E gamma can be written as a frame coefficient, which is less equal to the minus one times partial gamma. Okay, and this partial gamma can be estimated via interpolation estimates uh, between C0 and the top order norm. Okay, and this can actually work even if uh, uh, the top order norm is very bad by taking sufficiently many uh, derivatives. So if n is very large, we can guarantee that the contribution of the top order energy will be very minimal. So at the end of the day, the right hand side is better than t to the minus two, and this is consistent with the heuristic analysis. So it all boils down to the general solution of the left hand side. So if the left hand side is less singular than t to the minus one, we're done. Okay, so for k, this is exactly one over t. Okay, times initial configurations, which is what we expect. This is the optimal behavior. Uh, because the um, cast exponents are less than one, then the frame coefficients are also less singular than t to the minus one by assumption. Okay, so then it all boils down to, to controlling the spatial connection coefficients. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't diagonalize, so there is a system, actually, uh, a matrix uh, that sort of uh, mingles all the, all the components. Uh, and now the key observation uh, is that instead of estimating at the level of C0 the uh, spatial connection coefficients, we estimate the structure coefficients, which are a particular combination, a sum of two spatial connection coefficients, okay? And now the, uh, uh, the important observation is that the OD for these diagonalizes and for uh, uh, double indices, we are in the case of the frame coefficients. So pj is less than one, therefore uh, this, these structure coefficients are less singular t to the minus one. And the, uh, the ones with distinct indices, they are like t, a power of t that is related to this subcriticality condition, okay? And, but because we have assumed that this is less than one, the, the structure coefficients are less singular t to the minus one and everything works. So this is actually uh, uh, the only place where the subcriticality condition comes into play. So it's quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, okay, so let's summarize what we have done. So we uh, consider a Kastner, fixed Kastner solution that satisfies the subcriticality condition, which is valid either for the scalar field in all dimensions, spatial dimensions, or in vacuum for spatial dimensions larger or equal to 10. And we perturb the initial data, okay, in sufficiently high order Sobolev spaces. And then we prove that for the corresponding system, either in vacuum or for the scalar field, the solution um, satisfies this type of estimates. So the crucial spatial Ricci curvature estimate 
and the optimal estimate for k and the, the derivative of the scalar field, the time derivative of the scalar field, relative to a CMC foliation. Okay, so you can also add, say, a finite number of, of spatial derivatives if you like to these estimates if you consider n to be sufficiently high, uh, sufficiently large. Okay, and these, uh, so we only have optimal control at the low orders, but this is fine, and it's sufficient to um, capture the, the final Kastner exponents, which satisfy the, the Kastner relation pointwise, and to prove that the, the, the curvature invariants blow up, which in particular implies that the, in the past direction, the space-time is C2 uh, inextendable. Okay, so that's all I, had to, uh, I wanted to say, and thank you for your attention. I think, <clears throat> thank you very much for your, for your talk. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Uh, so, so if I understand, uh, one of the main uh, uh, aspects of the proof is that your C star is independent of N. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. And is it difficult to get? Or? So uh, if we go back to uh, this slide, yes. So uh, we only need to replace K. So, so when you do an er a top order energy estimate, uh, the only terms which are borderline, for example, here, uh, is when all derivatives hit gamma. So at the end of the day, the borderline terms have only uh, C0 uh, k coefficient, and, and therefore they depend only on the, uh, on the values of the background cast and exponents. So no matter how many derivatives you consider, you don't create more additional uh, borderline terms. So it, it is actually very important that C star is independent of and because then we wanted to. So there's a set of parameters that have to be appropriately chosen in order to close the whole scheme. Thanks. Okay, any more questions from the audience? That's right. Yes. So the, the, way, the way that it works is that given Kastner exponents uh, for the background, uh, there is a C star that is sort of uh, needed to, to, to obtain this estimate. And then depending on the C star, which of course we don't explicitly compute, we take N sufficiently large such that uh, we can interpolate. I know, I know. We actually, we don't need here, so in your book it's more involved. We don't need the uh, weighted descent, uh, descent scheme in the weights. Just interpolation uh, estimates work. But yeah, it's similar in philosophy. One more question is, uh, sorry, oh, this is far away. <laughs> Okay, um, I didn't catch the following. You have this, uh, the connection coefficients and then you rely on the structure uh, functions, but the, if we have an orthonormal frame, the connection coefficients are all determined in terms of the structure functions. That's right. Uh, so this is just, uh, you, <laughs> right, it's not, no loss of the, of, um, you're, you're not assuming anything, you're just, uh, no, no, Saying no. that you are concentrating on using the structure functions in place. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I understand. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, are there any questions from the, from the online audience? Maybe no, not one. that I can see. Okay. No, I don't think so. Okay, then uh, let's thank uh, Greg again for the... Uh, for, oh. Okay, one more question. Uh, thank you very much. So I have this perhaps naive question, but if we restrict the symmetry of uh, these one forms in a spatial part of the metric, does this help with the behavior around the singularity? So, so by assuming symmetries, you mean? Yeah, for example, if you have some uh, 
Lie algebra that this omega satisfy, as it is, for example, for Bianchi 9 space time? Yeah. Uh, so, de depending on the symmetry, so if this, there was a polarized condition that I mentioned, so if, you, you, if you, your symmetry already excludes this uh, singular, uh, dangerous singular terms in the spatial Ricci curvature, uh, then even in cases where in general without symmetries you would expect to see oscillations, you're not going to, uh, you're going to see Kastner type behavior. Okay, so there are actually, uh, there is a class for example like um, uh, U1 polarized that already eliminates the uh, structure coefficients with distinct indices and then the whole analysis is, uh, can, can be carried out in, in the same way. And we actually have that, have a, a, such a type of result, but I didn't have time to, uh, to present it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's uh, thank Greg again. Let's also manage to collaborate. Thank you very much. Okay, our second speaker, uh, our second talk will be delivered online, and our speaker is uh, Lance Rang Huang from the University of Connecticut. Um, Lance Rang completed her PhD in 2012 under the supervision of Rick Schoen in uh, Stanford and was an assistant professor at uh, Columbia University before moving to Connecticut. And today she will speak to us about the existence of static vacuum extensions. Please. Right. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks to the organizer for invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here or at least on the screen. Um, so I will talk about the recent work on existence of static vacuum extensions. And this talk is a joint work with Zhongshan and she is currently a postdoc at Yuka. So since Einstein uh, proposed the theory of generativity, uh, Shasho found out the uh, family of exact solution. So the family of exact solution uh, discovered by Shasho is parametrized by the total mass. And the solution, of course, is of fundamental importance in generativity in models of solar system. But perhaps the most sensational feature is it actually also models a static black hole space time. And because the solution it led to discovery of black hole and we get a really nice uh, amazing photo by Event Horizon Telescope of the real black hole photo a couple of years ago. But mathematically, the Schwarzschild solution is written quite simple, at least for the exterior solution, which I put here. So we think about this a product, uh, the manifold itself is a product manifold of R of the time, together with the, the spatial slice, which is exterior of a ball of radius 2n and is the total mass. And then the matrix actually has the splitting uh, factor is a what product is determined by a scalar function u and the Riemannian matrix g. So um, you can see in this exterior solution, um, u can be zero at some radius. And that's actually the boundary of black hole. In this case, it's just a minima surface in the Riemannian manifold of gn. So we will really, the, the point of talk today is to capture some property of Schwarzschild. And the property we want to emphasize in this talk is static. And we will also touch upon the Barco property being the minima, have a minima surface boundary. So what's static space time? So just like I wrote for Schwarzschild, it's a, a product manifold together with a wall product matrix and determined by a Riemannian matrix G and the scalar function u. So um, global from the Lorentzian geometry just said the uh, space time has a time-like killing vector and the killing vector is orthogonal to each t slices. So it's a special case of more general terminology called stationary, which has a killing vector but may not be orthogonal to the time slices. But the more special case here, the static space time, you can see the space time geometry can be fully captured by the Riemannian matrix G together with the, the function U. Uh, you can think about it as a lapse function as from the previous talk. So if you are looking for a vacuum space time, 
then uh, the, the pair G and U need to satisfy this coupled system. The first uh, tensor equation is the Riemannian Ricci of, uh, of the matrix G is uh, roughly the Hessian of the function U. And then also we require the function U to be harmonic. So if you take the trace of first set equation, you can see by imply the matrix has to be scalar flat. So this solution G and U uh, will call G is a static vacuum matrix and U is called a static potential. So uh, of course it has fundamental importance in general relativity because it gives you a rich flat space time, a vacuum space time. But also this come up um, in Riemannian geometry, in purely Riemannian geometry in the study of the scalar curvature deformation by Fischer Marston uh, and by Justin Covino. It also has a really interesting relation to rich flow in the study of gradient rich solid term and also with the emery Becquery matrix. And we will focus on the class of static matrix, which is asymptotically flat. So it models isolated system. And in uh, this class of manifolds, one can define the ADM mass and global invariant. So just to um, probably refresh your uh, mind about the definition is being asymptotically flat. It just said the manifold uh, outside the compact set exterior region is topologically trivial. It's the same as the exterior of Euclidean space. And the metric uh, also goes to the Euclidean metric. And in this case, we can define an invariant. So the definition of the ADMS is relevant. You, don't, you, don't, you won't see again in this talk, but just to tell you, it's a number. So given a metric, you come out a number and it's supposed to measure total mass by looking at the integral, flux integral of large sphere and the sphere goes to infinity. So there are some examples of asymptotically flat static vacuum manifolds. There are actually um, not many as far as I know. So uh, first, the Euclidean space is an uh, example, but it turns out to be the only asymptotically flat static manifold without boundary. So let's do to a classical work of Linus Rorich is actually using the modern mathematics, it's a very easy proof, but then also uh, has a later result by Shen and Go Wei Miao. They're looking at basically um, probably higher dimensions and also when the static potential is not positive. The Schwarzschild family we mentioned earlier is the only asymptotically flat static manifold with minimal surface boundary. So it, now it's called the uniqueness of static black holes and people think it's very natural. But when I look at the literature, uh, it was a really striking result by Israel in 67 um, because the result tells you if you have a, a static manifold with black hole, it only determined by the total mass because it has to be Schwarzschild, but just the mass tells you which Schwarzschild matrix it is. And then there's a, a sequence of the work to basically is 10 different assumptions on the boundary and uh, various removed various technical assumptions. There's also a family of wild SEO symmetric matrix um, so this is roughly the only list of exact solution I'm aware of, which describe as in topically flat and static vacuum manifolds. And there is some um, really a great effort trying to classify static manifolds and also understand the structure theory. But then today's talk I really focus on the other side. It's on the Barnick's static extension conjecture. So roughly speaking, the um, Barnick's conjecture says, while static metric can be classified in some situation, but in general, there yeah, are actually many, many uh, static, uh, static manifolds which are not from the list I show you. And they can be parametrized by the boundary geometry. So it was explicitly written down in Barnick's uh, 2002 ICM talk but the conjecture was around already for a while. We will see why later. But the conjecture says, if we start with a compact manifold with boundary, so omega and G0 is a compact manifold and we assume the scalar curvature 
of this compact manifold has, is not negative, then we can look at induced boundary geometry. So we have induced matrix and induced the mean curvature. So we suppose the mean curvature is not everywhere less or equal to zero. Then using this boundary data um, here, which G0, uh, T means the induced matrix on the boundary from inside and the induced mean curvature. Then we use this boundary data. Then there exists a unique asymptotically flat static vacuum exterior manifold, which match the boundary data. So also as the picture showed, this is interior and then they can find extension, search out the boundary match and this pair we will call the Barnick boundary data also match. So we want to first consider why we need this mean curvature assumption, right? Because it's really in the great contrast with the uniqueness of static black hole. In fact, the conjecture would fail if you allow the mean curvature to be less or equal to zero. And because if an extension, if an asymptotically flat extension exists, then you can use the barrier argument to show there's a minima surface homologous to the boundary. But then we know if the uh, if a static manifold has a minima surface boundary, then it has to be a threshold. And then we can use analytic continuation to see the whole thing has to be threshold, which tells you you cannot arbitrarily prescribe the induced matrix. But I want to also make the side remark is um, the static vacuum extension is in particular a scalar flat extension because static matrix here, the static vacuum matrix has zero scalar curvature. But one can actually construct uh, extension which has zero scalar curvature. So there are a lot of progress along this direction, for example, by Barnick, Xian Tan, uh, Montalidis Shen, and the recent work on the Montalidis in at higher dimensions. Okay, so we can see this mean curvature assumption is really to be there to prevent um, uh, more like a trivial counter examples. So um, the Barnick conjecture has been around, uh, originally for all the conjecture has been around for a while, but the year of 2002 is really the thing people start getting many uh, start get more interested because uh, the breakthrough results on the Riemannian parallel inequality of uh, Huizken, uh, Yomanan, and also by Bray, they really has a really intriguing connection to static manifold. So there is some partial progress toward the conjecture. So we know the existence when the Barnick data is very close to the data of the round sphere which is the induced um, metric and the mean curvature on the Euclidean round sphere. So a shown additional reflection of symmetry on the Barnick data is proven by Miao. And there's a, a fundamental work in this direction. And as a query, they are able to formulate this static vacuum equation uh, into elliptic equation by adding some suitable boundary gauge condition. And based on this work, Anderson Klein the result for this general case. But also there is a possible counter examples, which turned out to be very interesting uh, example. It's not known to be counter example yet, but it's highly expected to be counter example by Anderson Curry, Anderson Jerky. The example is actually, you can just look at any static manifold, just even in Euclidean space, you can take a non-embedded surface, which is only embedded from one side from inside. So it's a, a nice boundary of the interior part, but then it actually touched from outside. So from the exterior manifold, it's not a manifold with boundary. But then they just can look at the induced data. So you can look at in Euclidean space, you can look at induced data uh, from the Euclidean matrix. And it turns out the exterior Euclidean matrix is not even a valid extension because it's not a manifold with boundary, the injectivity radius here becomes zero. But the question is whether they can have other static extension. It's highly expected not possible because you put the Euclidean data, but it's not proven yet. So the main part of this talk is um, we show in greater generality 
on the existence and local uniqueness of the static vacuum extension. So let's look at the setting. Um, we're looking at the Euclidean space. Here I use GBAR for the Euclidean matrix. So we look at a bounded region omega. And then it has a, a boundary we call sigma. And we're showing the boundary is connected, embedded. And our proof use both assumptions. Um, why we need both assumptions? Let's talk about embeddedness because it's just as the anderson jerky example, if it's not embedded, there's some um, really strange behavior could happen. And we also use embeddedness for different, different reasons. But I think it should be a reasonable condition there. And for connected, it's really interesting because we most of the arguments work out for multi, for boundary with multi components, but there's just one basic thing we really need connectedness. And, but it turns out if it's not connected, then if you have multiple boundary components, and then if you have an extension, the question is also related to the static n body conjecture, which turns out very subtle, right? Because you say if you have n body and in the static configuration, and if the body satisfies some separation argument, it has to be the, the flat, the Euclidean space, because if the n body cannot stay static. But in any case, we need both assumptions, and our result says. First, uh, assume some condition, the sigma is static regular. I will not talk about this condition at all in this talk, unfortunately, because the time. But if it's static, then we can show first we have existence. For any uh, Barnick boundary data close to the induced data from Euclidean metric, then we can find extension, a static vacuum extension realize that Barnick boundary data. The second one is about local uniqueness. So uniqueness in this setting is very uh, delicate because given a solution, a static vacuum extension, you can always use diffeomorphism to, to pull back this solution and get another solution which look like different tensors. Right, but geometrically, they are actually the same solution. So the uniqueness has to be formulated carefully under some like a fixing gauge condition. So we, we show that if you fix the static harmonic gauge, which essentially is really similar to the harmonic gauge for Ricci curvature, but in this case, we need to use a static harmonic gauge. And also the orthogonal gauge, once you fix these two gauges, then the solution is unique. But I think most importantly is we are able to uh, verify their large class of surfaces or hypersurfaces satisfy the static regular assumption. So we show a convex surface in R3 is static regular. So which means you can look at the Barnick boundary data near the induced data on the convex surface and you can find a solution. And you know the solution, you can fine tune the mean curvature and the uh, induced matrix you know this is not the Euclidean, Euclidean uh, matrix. The extension is definitely not Euclidean. And in higher dimensions, we are able to show that generic hypersurface is static regular. So also our genericity is pretty general. It's say given any family of surfaces sigma t, and we call that the generalized foliation means it's foliation uh, in, it can be a foliation, but it can be more general. The foliation, the leaves can touch each other as long as they touch each other from a set of major zero. And then there's a, a open dense set of the parameter space T such that the sigma T is static regular. So just using this picture, this is a possible counter example. But then we can show, you can just looking at the surfaces inside, you move it inside and then for an open dense set T, sigma T is no longer a uh, counter example. You, it's a, a surface you can um, find the static extension for the nearby Barnick boundary data. And this also, you can just look at round sphere because of that dilational invariance, a round sphere is static regular and it's true for any dimension. So 
in this um, combined those theorems, we show that the Barnick's conjecture holds for large class of Barnick boundary data near the Euclidean data. So you can think about a result is like a small data result for the result near Euclidean induced data. So I will not talk about the proofs at all or the ingredients inside, but I want to say why uh, Barnick's come up with this conjecture. So it has a really interesting relation with the quasi-local masses. So here, I think this is a perfect phenomenon to think about the quasi-local, right? Quasi-local is a concept which is not talk about point-wise property. And it's not a global property. Like uh, here, I'm in the Connecticut of United States. I'm in my quasi-local area. And some of you are in Geneva. You are in your own quasi-local area. So in contrast, we are not talking about the whole um, the planet Earth or the whole um, United States or in Switzerland. And in this content, there's a more specific meaning of quasi-local masses. It's supposed to measure the total mass uh, of a bounded region, but you want to use only some kind of geometry, like a boundary geometry. So there are many definitions and I think they are all very useful in different ways. Many of definitions using the boundary mean curvature and the boundary the induced matrix but of course, there is some exception like a Huiskens isoperimetric mass and use the isometric uh, deficit instead of a boundary mean curvature. But I will talk about the Barnick's quasi-local mass. So the mass, uh, I think physicists usually don't like it because it's, um, it's really hard to compute. But for mathematicians, it's a very natural concept. Is we want to define the quantity for a bounded region. But we know we have the ABM mass will define, have many good properties defined for the unbounded region. So we will just do extension. So given a compact set, we want to look at extension, which is admissible in some way. And then we compute the ABM mass of the extension and then take an infima of it. So supposedly this should say, uh, inherit many good properties of the ABM mass. Being admissible means the extension is asymptotically flat, so we can compute the ADM mass and also have non-negative scale curvature, so the positive mass theorem applies. And then he proposed the boundary um, has to match in this way because, because uh, if you boundary match this way and one can see the scale curvature, the energy condition is uh, the non-negative across where you match. So it may not be smooth to compute the scale curvature, but at least distributionally, the scale curvature has a lower bound. And also require the extension contain no closed minima surface, the no horizon condition. So, and then we say the Barnick mass minimizer, if the extension is a minimizer, if it realize the infima. So the conjectures, uh, long-standing conjectures roughly say whether a minimizer exists, whether it's unique, and whether it, uh, what property of a minimizer has. Conjecture has to be a static vacuum matrix. So put all these three conjectures together, that will imply the static extension conjecture. So I think I'm almost run out of time. And so the current status is we know the third conjecture is true but there's still many remaining questions for the first two conjectures. Essentially, they're all widely open. Okay. So um, we talk about the uh, ex existence for small data, near Euclidean data, but in the uh, work in preparation, is we can actually uh, extend part of our arguments, although quite non-trivially, to the existence and local unique uniqueness for the boundary data near a Schwarzschild region. So the questions become more delicate because we know if you have a minima surface boundary, then the extension conjecture cannot hold. Right? So we need to find a, um, a good condition to avoid the minima surface boundary. So we are looking at only the exterior region of a Schwarzschild manifold and our results set a generic hypersurface which is homologous to the horizon boundary um, can have the extension. 
So in particular, our result give the following contrasting phenomenon to uniqueness of static black holes, which is static black holes theorem says, uh, if the boundary is minimal, then you don't care about what the induced matrix is. As long as the boundary is minimal, then this is only structural solution. So we can ask, how about we let the mean curvature to be arbitrarily small, very close to zero. Can you still expect some kind of uniqueness, uh, structural uniqueness? Our example say actually no. So no matter how small the constant epsilon you give, our results show you can find as in topic flat, static vacuum extension manifold defined on the exterior, such that the boundary has the mean curvature, which can be prescribed arbitrarily small, but the G is not isometric to structural. Okay, so I think probably that's the end of my talk. I will leave the questions open slides uh, after the talk so you can see. And also, um, if you want to know more details about proof, I have posted uh, video recordings from, uh, and from other occasions on my website. So you can go there, watch the videos and see more details. But I want to thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lanzuan, for your, for your talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Any questions from the online audience? I, I have a question to the, to the concept of uh, quasi-local mass. You said it uh, <clears throat> depends just on the boundary of the domain. It seems to me that the concept of quasi-local mass also relates somehow to the infinity you are involved with. So for example, Bartnik, um, defines his quasi-local mass with respect to an asymptotically flat infinity. You would get something different if you take something asymptotically hyperbolic. So I think it would be interesting to sort of study the concept of quasi-local mass um, of some compact domain with respect to some larger domain, not just with respect to infinity. So I, I think the, the sort of concept of quasi-local mass should be really be seen as, as a concept of mass between two different regions. Now, the easiest case would be if the second region extends all the way to infinity. How do you, does it sound to you correct or? Right. I think you have a really, really great point. So I have been wondering like, why do we need to consider as it be flat extension, right? So actually one of my former students and also I think Carla uh, Selabom and her collaborator, they have been looking at the extension. So even compact region, you don't care about which part, like uh, what you extend, right? So looking at the hyperbolic extension. Um, but I haven't thought about uh, like uh, what's the deeper connection between the extension you consider. But I think it's also related to like uh, the Wang Yao quasi-local mass because they have to put isometric embedding into a different reference space in some way. So it's, I think it's more subtle. I think it's like, a, as you say, you have to really compare with a larger region, right? Because the isometric embedding also has to choose what reference space to embed it to. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Not online. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll ask one question about the, uh, the uniqueness in your first uh, theorem. So you, you don't have ge geometric uniqueness, you, ha you only have uniqueness in, the, in a particular gauge. I mean, I, do you expect a stronger uniqueness? Or? Right, so this is actually geometric uniqueness. We show that for any, um, for any uh, given a solution, you look at the orbit by the homomorphism group and there's a, a unique one okay. which satisfies both gauge conditions. Okay. Right, but I think the most interesting thing is it's a local uniqueness. So we only show it's in the neighborhood of the, the background data, right? And I think the global uniqueness, it turns out to be a, a very hard question. For example, I'm not aware of any uniqueness of static uh, solution other than the structural uniqueness. So I think the global uniqueness will be uh, 
very difficult question. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then let's uh, thank uh, Lan Zhuang again for her talk. And uh, also for you, there's a medal which will be delivered to you. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's turn to our, our third talk. Our last speaker is uh, Yorgos Mosidis from Princeton University. Uh, Yorgos completed his PhD in 2018 under the supervision of uh, Mihalis Dafermos at Princeton and was a Miller Research Fellow at Berkeley from 2018 to 2021. And he's currently a Clay Research Fellow at Princeton and will be uh, very close to here, an assistant professor at uh, EPFL in Lausanne from the next uh, fall. And the title of his talk is The Instability of anti Space for the Einstein Scalar Field System. Please. Thank you very much, Gustav, for the introduction. And of course, it's a great pleasure for me to be speaking here in Geneva, even if, it, even if it's just virtually. So as the title suggests, my, my talk is going to be about uh, the phenomenon of weak turbulence appearing in the equations of general relativity. And in particular, the main object of this talk is going to be anti space spacetime, which is the simplest solution of the Einstein vacuum equations in the case when the cosmological constant is assumed to be negative. And in three plus one dimensions, uh, the ADS metric takes this explicit form, I've written down here. And one important characteristic of this metric is that ADS spacetime can be conformally identified with the interior of the Einstein cylinder, namely with, with the product metric R cross the northern hemisphere of S3. And through this conformal identification, it's easy to see that one can attach a conformal boundary at R equals infinity for ADS spacetime. And this is the boundary of the Einstein cylinder, which topologically looks like R cross S2. Now, because this boundary uh, has a, a time-like conformal structure, this means that ADS spacetime is not globally hyperbolic. And in particular, if one would like to solve a hyperbolic equation, say the wave equation, on an ADS background, then one would not get a unique solution if one only prescribed initial data, let's say, at t equals zero. Moreover, one should also prescribe boundary conditions at conformal infinity. And this will be important for us here because in this talk, we will be interested in the study of asymptotically ADS solutions of the Einstein equations, which themselves are of hyperbolic nature. And therefore, the right framework to study such solutions of the Einstein equations is, is provided by the initial boundary value problem. So how, how is the initial boundary value problem formulated? Well, in this case, one prescribes initial data in the form of either Cauchy data or characteristic data along a three, suitable three-dimensional hypersurface. Uh, which, and moreover, these initial data should satisfy the appropriate constraint equations. And moreover, one should also prescribe boundary data at the boundary at infinity. And this should be prescribed in terms of the conformal uh, geometry of that hypersurface. And of course, one should make sure once boundary data and initial data are prescribed that at this corner, where the initial hypersurface intersects the boundary at infinity, suitable compatibility conditions are satisfied. Now, the natural question that arises is, what type of boundary conditions lead to well-posed initial boundary value problem? This is highly non-trivial, again, because this, is, this, this boundary is only a conformal boundary at infinity. And moreover, the equations are of geometric nature. And the first person to, to work on this problem and provide a satisfying answer was Helmut Friedrich, who in 1995, proved the following. He said that for the class of, of boundary data, which, which consists of a prescription of a conformal structure at infinity, so for each prescription of a smooth conformal structure at infinity, and for each uh, smooth asymptotically ADS initial data, which are suitably regular uh, near the boundary, then there exists, at least locally in time, a smooth solution of the vacuum Einstein equations uh, attaining those data. And moreover, this solution is geometrically unique in an appropriate sense. So Friedrich identified a large class of boundary conditions for which well-posedness holds. And within this class, there is an important element. Namely, there is a unique reflecting boundary condition, which corresponds to the prescription of the conformal structure at infinity being that of the infinity of ADS spacetime, namely the conformal structure of the round cylinder R cross S2. And let me divert here a little bit and say the following. So this is a theorem about the asymptotically ADS uh, initial boundary value problem. But of course, it's not the only type of boundary conditions that are of interest to general relativity. One should also be interested, for example, in the, in the regular initial boundary value problem, where boundary data are prescribed along a regular hypersurface, not a hypersurface, not a boundary at infinity. And in some sense, this last problem is, in fact, in some sense, trickier than the asymptotically ADS boundary problem. 
And Friedrich and Nagy were the first to prove existence for, for, a, for a wide class of boundary conditions for the regular initial boundary value problem. But geometric uniqueness actually only became known very recently, last year, by the work of Furnodal and Sumlevici. Nevertheless, let me return to the asymptotically ADS initial boundary value problem, because this is going to be the main object of this talk. And let's now switch our focus to questions of the dynamics of the equation. Because once we have a well-posed initial boundary value problem, we're in a position where we can ask questions about the dynamics of solutions arising from initial data and boundary conditions with certain properties. And the trivial question in this context is that of the stability properties of the trivial solution, namely ADS spacetime, under perturbations with the simplest boundary conditions, namely reflecting boundary conditions. And in 2006, the Fermos and Holzegel actually proposed the following instability conjecture. They proposed that the following scenario holds, that there exists arbitrarily small of the ADS initial data, the trivial initial data, which if we let them evolve under reflecting boundary conditions at infinity, then they will eventually collapse into a black hole region. Now, ADS spacetime does not contain a black hole region. In particular, every point in ADS spacetime is visible from conformal infinity. Therefore, if one shows that a black hole region evolves, then this is an instability statement because initial perturbations which are close to ADS eventually led to a spacetime which is very far geometrically from being close to, to ADS. Moreover, this, this scenario can be interpret, interpreted as, as a scenario of weak turbulence in a geometric sense for the following reason. So morally speaking, we expect that the black hole is formed when enough energy is concentrated at a sufficiently small scale. So this scenario suggests that initial perturbations for which the energy was sufficiently spread out, this is encoded in the smallness assumption, I will come back to this in a moment, eventually lead to concentration of energy at sufficiently small scales so that the black hole is formed. And therefore, this is why this should be interpreted as a weak turbulence scenario. Let me also make a few more remarks about the statement of this conjecture. First of all, I, I, I wrote this conjecture in, in very vague terms. So immediately you might ask, okay, in, which, in what sense should perturbations of ADS be assumed to be small with respect to what type of initial data norm? And there, are, there could be many answers to this question. For example, one could, could require that initial perturbations should be small with respect to high order weighted Sobolev initial norms. For example, these are the type of initial, uh, of, of, uh, initial topologies for which well-posedness was shown to be true by uh, Helmut Friedrich. But on the other hand, one could also be a bit more minimalistic in the requirements and just assume that the uh, initial data are small with respect to an initial data topology for which well-posedness holds, and in particular, ADS spacetime is cosy stable because of course, without cosy stability, this question on instability uh, doesn't have any meaning. And moreover, ideally, one would also like to consider initial data norms for which the analogous problem for the zero cosmological case, the analogous, the analogous problem for perturbations of Minkowski, uh, has the answer that Minkowski space time is stable, let's say, for perturbations which are small with such norms. Okay, so, for example, with, with, uh, with such a requirement, the norm... Uh, the norm introduced by the total ADM mass of the initial data is not an appropriate norm to ask this question in that context, because this is a norm for which the initial, the initial value problem is not well posed. In particular, there exists initial data with arbitrarily small uh, ADM mass, which collapse into singularity in arbitrarily small times. Right? So in particular, the equations are in three plus one dimensions are super critical with respect to the total ADM mass. Anyway, so let's go back to our problem and to the, to the formulation of the ADS instability conjecture. And let's focus on the second aspect of this conjecture, namely the assumption that reflecting boundary conditions are imposed at infinity. And this is a crucial assumption. Uh, reflections at infinity are very important for the phenomenon of turbulence to appear after long time. And if one switches instead their attention to another class of boundary conditions, in particular, maximally dissipative boundary conditions, these are boundary conditions which allow the dissipation of energy at the boundary, then Holzegger, Luxem, Levici, and Warnick have shown that, at least at the linearized level, perturbations of ADS spacetime actually decay back to ADS at the super, super polynomial decay rate. And this very strong decay rate suggests that probably uh, an analogous statement is also true at the nonlinear level. Therefore, the choice of reflecting boundary conditions are crucial for the validity of this conjecture. And finally, let me also stress that I chose to, 
step to write down this conjecture for the vacuum Einstein equations because this is the simplest setting one can uh, introduce this conjecture. But the conjecture also makes sense for, in the case of matter, for matter models which are reasonable. For example, matter models for which Minkowski spacetime is still stable. Okay, so this is this is the statement of the ADS stability conjecture. So how would one approach this conjecture? How would one uh, uh, attempt to, to, to answer that conjecture? Well, in order to answer that conjecture, one has to exhibit a family of initial data which exhibit that instability. And one would like to assume as much symmetry as possible in order to make the construction of these initial data uh, easier. So ideally, one would like to work within the class of spherically symmetric initial data. And since, due to Pirikov's theorem, this is not possible for the vacuum Einstein equation, people have worked within the class of spherically symmetric initial data for the Einstein scalar field system as a substitute of the vacuum Einstein equation. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about the Einstein scalar field system. So let me go back a little bit into the problem of defining the initial boundary value problem. Because earlier, I only talked about the initial boundary value problem for the vacuum. Einstein equations. Now we also have a scalar field. So let's see how this scalar field changes the, the, choice, of, the choice of boundary conditions at infinity. And let's first focus on the simplest, on the very simple case of a linear scalar field on a pure ADS background. So if we have a linear scalar field phi solving the Klein Gordon equation here, here we have a parameter alpha, which parameterizes the Klein Gordon mass of this equation. So if we have a, a linear scalar, scalar field on ADS spacetime, then formally we can expand phi into a, into a power series expansion in terms of powers of r near r equals infinity. So here I've written down just the first two terms in this expansion. And the exponents in r in those two terms can be determined by the equation in terms of the Klein-Gordon mass here. So we see that there is a special value of alpha, namely alpha equals minus one, when these exponents here are one and two respectively. So in the case when alpha is equal to minus one, this is known as the conformally coupled case. This expansion here is just a regular Taylor, Taylor expansion of the field r times phi at r equals infinity in terms of the variable, let's say one over r. So this, is, so this means that we can really think of the first term in this, in this expansion as the Dirichlet data imposed at the boundary, while the second term in this expansion corresponds to the normal derivative, in particular the Neumann data at the boundary. Of course, this expansion is valid also for other values of alpha, but now if alpha is different than minus one, these exponents here will not differ by an integer. Therefore, this is a singular expansion. Nevertheless, this gives us the motivation to try to prescribe Dirichlet data at infinity in terms of prescribing this, uh, this first term in the expansion here, while Neumann data correspond to prescription of the second term here in this expansion. And, and of course, now the question is, you know, how do we get well posedness by prescribing uh, either Dirichlet or Neumann or more com complicated boundary conditions using this term? And this is, again, a non-trivial question to answer. For example, in the case of the linear Klein-Gordon equation on a general uh, asymptotically ADS background, the fact that prescribing homogeneous Dirichlet conditions at infinity when alpha is bigger than minus nine over eight, when this term here is positive, the fact that this leads to a well posed initial boundary value problem was first established by us. But going to the case of the, of the Einstein scalar field system for general values of alpha, the answer is only known under the assumption of spherical symmetry. So within, within spherical symmetry, Holzegel and Smulevici first showed that the initial boundary value problem is well posed when homogeneous Dirichlet data are assumed at infinity, again, when alpha is bigger than this critical value. And moreover, Holzegel and Warnick showed that well postness holds for more general boundary conditions, including Neumann boundary conditions, when alpha lies within these two values. When alpha lies within these two values, this has the effect that both these uh, terms in this expansion here are square integrable closed in field. Okay, so this is, so we're going to attempt to answer the ADS instability conjecture in the, in the, in the context of the Einstein scalar field system, restricted to the, the conformally coupled case, when alpha is equal to minus one. Therefore, we're going to, to be, we will be interested in the case of either Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions. This will be the choice of reflecting conditions for us. And the first numerical and heuristic study of the ADS instability conjecture in this setting was done by Bizon Rostvorovsky in 2011, who studied, again, the conformally coupled Einstein scalar field system with homogeneous Dirichlet conditions at infinity. And numerically, by evolving 
a small perturbation of the trivial initial data, they realized that these perturbations, after some time, reach very close to the regime of black hole formation. But moreover, they also worked heuristically on this problem, and they proposed an instabi heuristic instability mechanism based on perturbative analysis. So what they, what they said was roughly the following. So let's look at the effective equation satisfied by the scalar field. So in appropriate coordinates, for example, ones constructed by optical functions, we can, the, the equation for the scalar field takes this form. So this here on the left-hand side, we have uh, the Klein-Gordon equation on ADS space-time. And the, on the right-hand side, we have a nonlinearity of semi-linear type, which looks like a non-local nonlinearity of cubic form. So it roughly looks like that. So if we ignore for at first the nonlinear part and we just focus on the linear part, then we see, so if, in other words, if we just look at the first term in the perturbative uh, expansion for phi, then this equation here, for this equation, solutions to this equation here can be decomposed into modes that evolve independently of each other. Now, once we turn the nonlinear interaction on, then these modes will no longer evolve independently of each other, but they will start exchanging energy. And one Bizon and Rastorovsky realized is that when Dirichlet conditions are assumed at infinity for the conformally coupled case, then this system of interactions actually gives rise to resonant interactions, which, which have the effect of energy, at least at this perturbative level, transferring from low frequency modes to high frequency modes consistently in time. Therefore, they suggested that this, mechan this perturbative mechanism actually, actually leads the system all the way to the regime of black hole formation. And after that work, there was a huge explosion of numerical and heuristic works on this problem, which studied, first of all, the, what happens in the case of, of uh, different boundary conditions or different values of the Klein-Gordon mass. And moreover, what happens to, let's say, generic perturbations of ADS spacetime? Because the ADS instability conjecture claims that there exist special perturbations, there exist arbitrarily small but special perturbations of ADS, which eventually collapse into black holes. So the question is, what does this happen generically for all perturbations of ideas? Or do there exist spatial perturbations or even open sets in the space of perturbations which have the property of never collapsing into black hole? Such open sets of perturbations, if they exist, they would be called islands of stability. And the question of whether islands of stability do exist or not is very hotly debated. And numerical analysis suggests that at least for the time scale uh, suggested by perturbative uh, analysis, islands of stability might exist. In any case, this, this result that I told you about provide a numerical heuristic study of the, of the question, but the, no rigorous proof has been obtained so far using this perturbative approach. And there is good reason for that. Using the, 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 the statement of the ADS instability conjecture claims the creation of a black hole eventually. And this means that at some point, the system should exit the perturbative regime, where this perturbative analysis will be will be no longer useful. For this reason, in order to obtain a rigorous proof of, proof of the conjecture, one has to use an alternative approach. And the approach I'm, I will be using here is based on the interaction of short pulses of matter in physical space, rather than the interaction of modes in frequency space. And working in physical space will have the advantage of giving us the opportunity to use the monotonistic properties of the equations, which are not so clear in frequency space. OK, so let me first give you a heuristic picture of of the proof of the ADS instability conjecture for the Einstein scalar field system, and then get into some of the details of the rigorous proof. So what I'm going to say now uh, is uh, I'm going to present the heuristic picture. OK, so what, what do we want to do? We want to prove that there exist arbitrarily small perturbations of ADS for the Einstein scalar field system that eventually, after evolution with reflecting boundary conditions, collapse into black holes. So the way we're going to construct our initial perturbations is that we're going to assume that initial, our initial perturbations have the form of a large number of bumps. And these bumps will evolve, we expect them to evolve like short pulses, forming beams within the space time. And this, these bumps, which we will assume are very narrow, will evolve, they will initially form a series of ingoing beams. These beams will interact with each other, they will come close to R equals zero, then move towards R equals infinity, be reflected there, and keep interacting with each other again and again. And away from R equals zero, exactly because we will assume that these beams are very narrow, we will be able to use the geometric optics approximation, which for the Einstein scalar field system is just is the Einstein null dust system. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to see how these beams exchange energy with, with each other. And we hope to be able to show that at the end, there is a beam which has gathered enough energy so that it collapses into a black hole before reaching close to R equals zero. Okay, so let's, let's focus on it, on the interaction of those beams. And we're going to measure the energy content of each beam simply by the difference of the Hawking mass, the normalized Hawking mass, if you want, because of the cosmological constant, in the nearly vacuum regions surrounding this spherically symmetric beam. And since we want to show that at some point a black hole is formed, we want to show that there exists a point in space-time at some point such that 2m over r, where r now is the radius of the sphere of symmetry, becomes bigger than 1. Okay, so let's focus on two beams interacting, intersecting with each other. So here, I've, 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 I, I will be using uh, null coordinates, so u and v are optical functions of the space-time. And here I have an ingoing beam, a beam moving towards r equals 0, and an outgoing beam, a beam moving towards r equals infinity, um, intersecting each other. And because we have a heuristically here, we assume that we are away from r equals zero, 0, and therefore the geometric optics approximation holds, there is a very simple formula satisfied by the Hawking mass, which can be derived from the equations for the Einstein null dust system. And this formula is as follows. So using this formula, we can actually get approximate formulas for the exchange of energy between these two beams. And by integrating this formula in the region here where these two beams interact, we can easily see that the energy of the ingoing beam increases, and it increases by a factor which depends on the energy of the outgoing beam. And, it's, and this increase is stronger when this interaction takes place closer to r equals zero, while the energy of the outgoing beam decreases of course, in a way such that the total energy of those, two, of those beams is conserved. So remember, the energy of the incoming beam always increases, the energy of the outgoing beam always decreases, and the interaction is stronger close to R equals zero. So now let's follow those two interacting beams for some time. So initially, we have those beams emanating from the initial data. They first interact here in this region, and in this region, the beam that was initially to the right is ingoing. Therefore, this beam gains energy here while the same beam, when they interact again, loses some energy, because now it's outgoing. However, this second interaction here takes place close to r equals infinity, while the first interaction takes place close to r equals zero. Therefore, the energy that was gained by this beam initially is much larger than what it lost in this second interaction. Therefore, all in all, we see that through these uh, interactions, energy flows from beams which were initially to the left towards beams which were initially to the right. And if we made sure that initially beams that, that were originally to the right are narrower than the ones on the left, then this mechanism, for as long as uh, it keeps working as intended, will have the effect of energy flowing from, from larger to smaller scales. So this is a mechanism driving turbulence. This is, and this is the mechanism that we want to use in a rigorous proof of the conjecture. And my claim is, and I'm, I ran out of time, but I hope I have two more minutes because I started a bit later. And the claim is that indeed this, this uh, heuristic mechanism that I told you about can actually be turned into a rigorous proof of the ADS instability conjecture for the Einstein scalar field system. In fact, this mechanism, the way I described it to you, doesn't use much, uh, many details about the system, at least at this level of discussion. In particular, it seems that such a mechanism would work for any system that uh, under the geometric optics approximation reduces to the einstein Aldas system. And indeed, I was earlier able to obtain a proof of the ADS instability conjecture for the, for the case of the einstein masters vlasov system, which has the advantage of allowing the construction of perfectly localized beams of matter, which do not decohere. But now my claim is that the same mechanism can be used to prove the following theorem, that for the conformally coupled einstein scalar field system, this is the case when the klein golden mass alpha is equal to minus one, there exists a family of spherically symmetric, let's say, characteristic initial data with the following property. This, this, this initial data can be chosen to be arbitrarily small with respect to the bounded variation norm of crystal Dulu. This is a norm which, uh, I mean, here I'm omitting a few details, but morally corresponds to the L1 norm of the second derivative of the scalar field in, in an appropriate gauge. And the claim is that for any, for, for any of those initial data, uh, if we look at the, at the evolution with either Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions at infinity, eventually a black hole is formed. And you might uh, complain here that 
I'm only considering here initial data which are small merely with respect to a low regularity norm. This bounded variation norm here that I wrote down, this is a scaling vanier norm uh, with respect to the scaling of the equations in three plus one dimensions. But my claim is that this norm is good enough. In particular, well positiveness for the initial boundary value problem for this system with respect to this norm follows by doing some straightforward modifications uh, of the proof provided by Christodoulou for, for, again, for the well positiveness of the initial value problem with this norm in the zero cosmological case. Okay, so in the last minute, let me just very quickly try to give you an idea of how to turn the heuristic ideas that I told you about earlier into a rigorous proof in this case. Well, again, what we want to do is that we want to construct initial data which have the form of a large number of bumps. Each of them is very narrow and there should be some uh, hierarchy between the distances, let's say, between two successive bumps and the sizes, the widths of each of those bumps. Uh, let me come back to this a bit later, if I have the time. And let me tell you that the main obstacle to, in, to turning the previous heuristics into a rigorous proof is that of decoherence. So these beams of, of, of formed by the scalar field will, as time evolves, decohere. So while initially our initial data will give rise to a large number of beams interacting with each other, slowly over time, these, these beams of matter will decohere. And after some time, it could be the case that our solution looks nothing like a collection of beams. Therefore, how, how can we make sure that you know, this heuristic mechanism that we described earlier can actually be implemented? And the claim is that we, the claim is that we cannot actually get rid of decoherence in a simple way. In fact, exactly because we assume that our initial data are only small with respect to the scale invariant norm, so in particular the scale invariant size of each beam is in some sense bounded from below uh, quantitatively, this means that a certain amount of decoherence will happen any time a beam goes close to R equals zero. So what we want to do is that we want to make sure that this decoherence will not be too serious up to the point when a black hole is formed. And the, and the reason this decoherence always happens is that if we look at the effective equation satisfied by the scalar field in, let's say, double null coordinates, here the nonlinear term contains a term which looks like, let's say, in terms of the variable r times phi, it would look like m over r cubed. And m over r, m over r is a scale invariant quantity, right? So we have two scale invariant quantities coming into play. The, the BV norm that we measure the size of the initial data and m over r. And in the end, remember, we want to show that m over r becomes larger than one. So I don't have much time to go into the details, but let me just say that the, what saves the day here in terms of uh, the problem of decoherence is that M over R is a much weaker scale invariant quantity than the BV norm. And in particular, by suitably choosing uh, our initial data, we can make sure that, uh, that while the total BV size of, of the solution keeps increasing, up, at least up to a point where a certain profile is formed, M over R remains small. And therefore, this keeps uh, decoherence at control. And then once a certain profile is formed, and this is a profile where each beam obtains enough, uh, each beam has scale invariant size which forms an exponential profile, then within one set of interactions, a black hole is formed. And how does this happen? Well, once such a profile is formed, then after those beams interact with each other, using let's say the, appro the approximate energy exchange formulas that I showed you earlier, then those beams will acquire, will have scale invariant size, which is bounded from below by some constant. Therefore, when the last beam intersects all those outgoing beams, this last beam will actually intersect a very large number of beams having scale invariant size bounded from below. Therefore, this large beam will feel as if it propagates along a discreetly self-similar background. Therefore, it will suffer a huge blue shift instability. This was the one identified by Christodoulou uh, in his study of uh, we cosmic sensors conjecture for the Einstein scalar field system. And through this blue shift mechanism, the energy content of this final beam will actually increase sufficiently so that eventually a black hole is formed as this beam moves towards R equals zero for one last time. Anyway, uh, I'm definitely out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. And I leave this slide for open questions for the future open in case you have some questions about it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yorgos, for your talk. Uh, questions from the audience, please.
please. Uh, thank you for a great talk. So this heuristic picture that you showed us seems to rely very heavily on the reflecting boundary conditions. And uh, I caught that you mentioned something about other uh, boundary conditions. C could you please give me another heuristic picture, how to realize it with different boundary conditions? So I wasn't, I should have been more careful. So what I meant is that people uh, doing numerics have also looked at other reflecting conditions, for example, Neumann, let's say, rather than Dirichlet condition, which was the original one. Now, in, in what I'm doing, this heuristic mechanism applies to all reflecting boundary conditions. So in particular, let's say, in the case of, let's say, interest, both Dirichlet and Neumann conditions. And however, in the case of different boundary conditions, um, it's not very clear to me even how well poisoners would have, been. let's say, once we move outside the reflecting boundary condition regime, and also if we move outside the conformally coupled case, it's not clear to me even how well poisoners would have been established in this low regularity topology. Okay, I see, thank you. But, yeah, so. Please. Could you, could you again remove the, the mask and, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't hear you. I, I see that uh, four years ago, when I uh, talked to you at Princeton, you were doing the null dust. Exactly. And then you moved to this kinetic model, right, to the Vlasov Exactly, equation. exactly. And then eventually, now, uh, how recent is this work, which you... Well, it's... I mean, I still haven't uploaded on the archive, but it's, uh, it's done, so it's... Uh, Ah, it's so very it's, recent. It's very, very recent with the scale. Yeah. I, think. I see. It's a good progress, I think. Good. Thank you. I have nothing else to say. Do you do you have any insights on the on the vacuum or leaving the symmetry? Um, yes, I do. But now there are also some. Yeah. So, in the case of the vacuum, suppose that one would like to prove again that ADS is unstable using a similar mechanism, what would be required? So what, were, what should be the ingredients? So first and foremost, for philosophical reasons, one should be able to prove that, first of all, that the analog of those perturbations, which in the vacuum case, those would be, let's say, initial perturbations supported around spherical cells, which are very narrow in the spherical directions, but very regular, sorry, very narrow in the radial directions, but very regular in the spherical, the angular directions. One would like to obtain, first of all, a well positedness theory in an initial data class which contains you know, such solutions, let's say with, uh, and let's say such an initial data class would be an initial data which is like H3 halves with additional regularity in the, in the angular directions, something like that. So once such a theorem is known, and I have good reasons to believe that uh, this is true, then the major challenge in establishing, let's say, this conjecture with the same mechanism would actually be controlling the problems at the boundary. Because in spherical symmetry, and in particular in the conformally coupled case, the, the, the problems at the boundary actually become very simple. This is no longer the case in the vacuum case. Actually, it's not clear to me even what would be the appropriate gauge uh, to prove well positiveness near the boundary, which, has, which will allow for good control for very long times. You know, it will not develop caustics, it will not be like a, the gauge of uh, Friedrich, for example, or something like that. So this is a technical, a big technical uh, obstacle. But let's say conceptually, it looks that something similar could be okay. employed. Thank you. Any more uh, questions? Uh, maybe some online, uh, do we have online questions? No, we don't have it, no. Okay, maybe we can take one last question from the audience. Okay, there's none, so let's just, uh, Thank you, Jorgos, again for his talk. And again, there's a, a medal for you also to commemorate the occasion which we sent to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very much.